I'll talk to you about sustainable aviation fuels. Probably spend about 15 minutes doing so, and we'll have lots of time for questions, I hope, as well, and looking forward to that. So for this presentation, I'm really going to focus on demand and production. And I think that links very well to some of the questions we had earlier today as well. So we will look again in more detail in terms of the ICAO CAF agreement. And what does that actually mean in terms of SAF? What does it mean in terms of SAF in 2030? And we'll take a look at what really exists currently in terms of policies around the world. So it's regional and national policies. And again, what does that mean in terms of SAF 2030? And then we'll take a look at airline commitments. What will that entail in terms of volumes for 2030? And what we'll see, and it was briefly mentioned today as well, what we'll see is actually there's, there's quite good demand drivers already there in terms of SAF in that time frame. So we'll take a look at that. And it's an important aspect to take into account. A lot of the demand drivers I'll explain to you are complementary. They overlap in different ways. We'll, we'll, we'll consider that in greater detail going forward as well. Then we'll take a look at production. We'll take a look at what is the outlook, how much renewable fuel is going to be developed out to 2030, how much of that is likely or is necessary to be SAF, and then we'll come back and say, where, where are we today? And there, there are challenges, and I want to just emphasize that from the outset. There is action that we all need to take to make sure that we have this optimum output of SAF going forward. 2030 is part of the story. We also need to think about how we get to 2050. So we will address that as well as part of this presentation. So let's move forward. So the ICAO conference, as Marie mentioned, it's a conference on aviation alternative fuels, the third iteration of that. And what does it mean? First of all, the output is a vision itself. The, the initial intent and the main intent of that, folk, of that conference is really to, to make sure that we can actually accelerate the development and deployment of SAF around the world, right? That's fundamentally important, is to reduce risk, to increase investment. And it's really to focus on decentralization of SAF production from a couple of markets to make it more broader across the world as well. It's fundamentally important. And the main output, which you're all aware of, I think, now, is a vision. And the vision is for 5% reduction in emissions for international aviation. That's important to remember. International aviation through the use of SAF or lower carbon aviation fuels. Now, when we do the analysis, we can project that in 2030, the emissions would total 682 million tons of CO2. So to meet this vision, it's not a target, to meet this vision, that would mean that we would need to actually reduce emissions by 34 million tons by 2030 through the use of SAF and LCAF, right? And from our calculation, what that means is that we would need access to 14 million tons of SAF. That's an important figure to remember as we go forward in the presentation as well. Now, as, as well as the vision in terms of the 5% reduction, there's also some um, key policy levers which have been developed as well, a global framework in terms of policy to help ICAO and states move forward on this to facilitate that production level. Also, there are um, various enablers, and enablers which are going to be progressed through ICAO in terms of capacity building. There is a FinInvest hub, uh, which will allow some, some collaboration between stakeholders for new production facilities, the financiers, the different stakeholders coming together. And also, there, will, there are some recommendations into what to really progress for this SAF accounting framework, which was mentioned earlier today as well. So that's CAF. So that is policy global level, right? And that was international aviation, don't forget. Now, if we look at what is actually out there already for policy at a regional or a national level, well, first of all, there's two types of policy, I think. In, in, you know, if, if we compartmentalize the, the general types of policies, there's two types of policy. One is policy which is developed, yes, by governments, but it's in co collaboration with industry itself. And it's really to ramp up production, it's to ramp up technological developments, ramp up procurement as well. So these are more incentive-based policies. And you can see those in the green there. And that's really so industry-led and supported by governments in terms of funding and other actions as well. Then you have mandates. And mandates are imposed on the industry. So they are government-led, but the risk is taken by industry. So they're quite different approaches. And of course, we, we are 
very um, eager to find out how these things work. I mean, we are, we are quite clear that the way, for example, the incentive-based policies are developed, for example, through the, the SAF grant challenge, there's a good mechanism there because the consultation has been so great and you've got all the major players involved. So you've got CAFI. CAFI is the Commercial Aviation Alternative Fuels Initiative, right, in the US. And then you've got feedstock providers, you've got producers, you've got suppliers, you've got airlines, all collaborating with the government to define how best to ramp this up and where that investment needs to be made. So this is a good framework, but we need to see equally our mandate successful on the other side, right? Because just because you have a mandate doesn't mean that you'll have the production volume. And I think that's a misconception in many cases. Ideally, what we want from any policy measure is the progress towards functioning markets for SAF, supply, and availability. That is what we need, and that's the goal, really. So the two numbers to remember here, 10.3 in terms of incentive-based policies, and 7.3 in terms of mandates overall to date, okay? Totaling around 17 million tons of SAF in terms of policies which have already been defined on regional and national level. Let's have a look at airline commitments, because Airlines have also committed to different levels of SAF uptake. Um, and so if we look out to 2030, we're looking at a total of 43 airlines here. And they have different levels of ambition between 5% and 30% at, at, at the 2030 time frame, right? So most of those converge around 10%. And again, if we look at, when we do our calculation, what we see is that this what, we, what we've seen in terms of the total commitments would tally up a requirement for around 13 million tons of SAF. So, global policy, 14 million tons of SAF. Existing regional, national policies, 17 million tons of SAF. Commitments from airlines, 13 million tons of SAF. Of course, these will all increase over time as well. And as I mentioned at the outset as well, these overlap to some extent. They basically reinforce the demand where they overlap, but they're also, um, you, but you can't add them li linearly, of course, but they are greater than, than individual components, right? And I think we are heading very close to what we stated in our roadmap ambition for 2030, which is 24 megatons already. And as I say, these commitments and these requirements or these visions will increase anyway. But the message, very important message is there's a lot of demand drivers already out there for 2030. And it all heads in the right direction. So I think that's a very important factor we all need to consider. So we stop having this perpetual discussion about what's a demand driver, what's a demand signal, and so on. You have policy. You have global visions. You have airline commitments. It's all out there, to, by and large, there. And it will still continue to develop. Let's have a look at production. Now, production is a bit of a different story. But I think, you know, during previous uh, discussions, for those of you that have been around at um, the AGM or previous Global Media Days, we've talked about the total capacity for renewable fuel, right? And SAF is one output of the renewable fuel processing. So we need to take a look at, first of all, the total capacity. And when we look at what is out there uh, in terms of announced projects, we can see that for renewable fuel, there will be a total capacity of around 63 megatons by 2030. Now, some of these projects may fail. Some new, might, new ones might come in, but I think this is a good baseline for us to actually work towards. 63 million tons of renewable fuel. And the key question, of course, is, as I mentioned earlier, what is the output of SAF? What percentage of that is going to be SAF? That is really, really important to us. And, uh, and I'll, I will explain why that's important in the next slide. But so far as to say, when we look at the numbers for renewable fuel out there uh, for 2030, and you look at those numbers in black on the chart, they're the tallies for the actual individual regions. You know, if you divide that by three, you get quite close to the chart I showed you in terms of what is a SAF requirement for individual regions at this stage, right? And actually, so what I'm saying is, if, if, you, if we can head towards a cut of 30% for SAF, 30% of SAF, is the output from renewable fuel refining. That is not only a good ambition, it fits with where, where we are in terms of demand expectations. Actually, it also aligns to what would be the optimum output in the heifer refining process. 
So everything converges around that sort of number. And it may be a little bit lower, maybe a little bit higher. That's okay, but we need to head towards that, that number itself. Now the problem is, where are we today? Are we at 30%? Um, we're not, unfortunately. So let me step back. Let me start off with some good news. The good news, of course, is that SAF production has increased compared to last year. So last year we were at 0.24 million tons. Um, and um, this year we're at about 0.5 million tons. So hey, that's a 100% increase. So that's, that's a good figure, isn't it? The problem is we were expecting greater output, significantly greater. Um, and um, unfortunately, where we were expecting that greater output, that, that, has, that has not come to fruition. That could be due to delays in terms of refineries opening, but it's also that some refineries did not produce SAF and we expected as well, and we hoped for. This creates a problem. And what it means is that SAF, as a total percentage output from renewable fuel was only 3%. Oh, no, we said we wanted to be at 20, uh, 25 to 30%. We're at 3% today. That's a problem. And part of the problem, and what's driving some of this, is if you can, if we have a situation, which we do have today, where there are incentives for the production of other renewable fuels, like renewable diesel, then the output's going to go more to that. There will be more output for renewable diesel than there is for SAF. And we're in danger of aviation, once again, being this forgotten cousin, which is just left to fuel for itself when everybody else gets the support. So it's really important that aviation has the balance incentives. SAF has a balance incentive compared to other renewable fuels. Otherwise, we will not get what is the optimum output in terms of SAF from the refineries. I think that's a pretty obvious argument, but unfortunately, that's not what's been looked into right now. So we need all stakeholders to step back and say, how do we make this work? How do we make this work for aviation as well as other, other sectors, right? So I think that's really important. So at 3% now, uh, we do think SAF production will, will ramp up again next year, and hopefully we can get that 3% to 6%. So we'll be heading in the right direction, but we are gonna focus on this a lot to make sure that we can head towards what is necessary for the demand uh, necessary for 2030. It's a fundamental aspect for us to look into. Oops. Okay, so that's SAF demand and production out to 2030. Once we get to 2030, so let's just take that as, a, as, as, as the step which, we, which we're heading towards. Once we get to 2030, we still need to ramp up production 20-fold to meet 2050 objectives. So there's still a huge amount of work to do once we get to 2030. And I think we all are cognizant of this. And how do we get there? So there's four things we need to focus on. I, mean, I think many of you would have heard me talk about uh, pa um, pathway diversification before, moving away from the heifer pathway, looking at different pathways. We do need to really capitalize on the broader sustainability benefits of the feedstocks which we'll be using going forward as well. And there's a lot that can be offered. We need to look at how best we can um, develop those regional and national value chains for the feedstock and for the production as well, because there's a lot of opportunity there. And then we come back to that SAF accounting framework, which is so important to make this work, because that SAF accounting framework is necessary to unlock feedstock where it's best developed, production where it's most, most, most viable, and then the actual usage itself. And we need this for this industry. We need this for SAF. We need this for aviation, because aviation is global and we're at such a nascent stage right now in terms of this market, this is what's necessary to really pump it, get it, get it going. Okay, so I'll show you a chart which you've seen before, which I think is a very lovely looking chart. Um, so I have no shame in showing to you again. Um, but really what, what, we're, what we're looking at is on the left-hand side is um, all the different feedstocks. And as I mentioned, what we want to do is to move away from the top feedstocks you see, which are then primarily using this heifer pathway, and move down and, and, see, and utilize the vast array of other feedstocks which will be available across the world. And there's a great opportunity there. We need to look at different, of course, really ramp up and scale up different technologies. That's the alcohol to jet solution, the fissure troughs, look at different conversion technologies. But the, the key message is you can marry up different feedstocks to those different 
technologies and convergent pathways, right? So there's, there's not just two or three options here, there's a myriad of options. And you can use different feedstocks in different environments to, to, to select the best production solution as well to, to actually develop SAF across the globe. And that's really important. And all these areas are being looked into in terms of standardization, certification, et cetera. So, the broader sustainability benefits. Why is this important? Well, it's because some of the feedstocks I mentioned as well, when we look at aggregated waste, when we look at recultivating degraded land, there's a lot of benefit out there. So this is not just about uh, SAF as we've, we've developed so far in the heifer pathway, because that's gonna be capacity constraint going forward. This is about really making the most use of the opportunity in developing regions as well. And you're, you're able to try and find ways in which we can support land restoration, biodiversity, job creation as well. It's not just about aviation, because it's not just aviation that's gonna benefit from this, it's other users of renewable fuels as well, because it's all feedstock is used in that renewable fuel refinery, right? So it's, it's the users, but it's also the local community that are able to develop the feedstocks and the production. So there's a, there's, there's a very important story here which we need to start to build on. It's not about them and us. It's not about, uh, it's not about different regions. It's, it's, there's an opportunity here which can also support greater energy diversity um, and security as well. And here you can see some of those feedstocks by region. Um, and again, diversifying away from the heifer pathway what is the opportunity we have in terms of feedstocks? Every region has its own opportunity. And what we are gonna be spending some time on in the coming months, in the new year, is really looking into these feedstocks to see what is actually available in terms of volumes. What are the economic benefits of using these feedstocks in a particular region? And how can this be built up in terms of the ramp up requirements for SAF going forward as well? So this is, if you, if you take that back to the diagram I showed you previously where you marry up the feedstocks with the, with the pathways, you can see the opportunity here, but it's also different by region. I think it's an important point as well. So let me summarize. Um, I mean, if, I, if I build on something which Marie said earlier, I think it's quite important that we really are focused on the investment requirements, that investment is targeted and it goes in to, f to help produce the feedstocks and also the production facilities. And that's not just investment from the new fuel companies, it's also investment from the, from the big oil companies as well. Everyone has to, to play in this game to make this work. It's fundamentally important. We need incentives from governments to make sure there is a balance between what is encouraged as an output for other products from renewable fuel, so renewable diesel and other products versus SAF. SAF cannot be the forgotten um, partner in this game. That will be a big problem for all of us. We need to diversify in terms of uh, feedstocks and the production as well to make sure we are able to, to decentralize SAF production and quickly. And I think that's, that's a real key objective and that's very much in line with the IKO output as well. And finally, we need recognition and real momentum in the development of this global framework um, so that everybody can use a standard set of rules and capability for accounting for emissions from SAF uh, from our industry, which is global, of course, as well. And that has to be recognized by all partners. Aviation's goal is to reach net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Key to aviation's decarbonization will be the use of sustainable aviation fuels, or SAF. And for SAF's potential to be fully reached, we need a global, consistent, accurate and credible claiming of carbon emissions reduction. We call this a SAF accounting framework. SAF is more challenging to track than fossil-based fuel. SAF can be produced from many sources, used cooking oil, municipal solid waste, agricultural residues, etc. And because SAF emits carbon when burned, like conventional jet fuel, the emissions savings from SAF take place in the production process. Each feedstock used for SAF has a unique emissions reduction profile, largely defined by the production process, including by the energy source powering SAF production. 
Once SAF enters the supply chain and becomes mixed with conventional jet fuel, it's no longer trackable. A globally standardised accounting system is needed to record what SAF was made from, how it was produced and who gets credit for the savings achieved. Governments have agreed on globally recognised sustainability criteria to measure this against, but to work credibly, SAF accounting must encompass a large value chain of players. IATA is collaborating with these players on best practices to underpin a globally harmonised SAF accounting approach. It must safeguard against double counting, errors, duplication and fraud. These are early days, but there is momentum amongst governments to do this. Of course, while a SAF accounting framework is critical, it will mean little unless governments put supportive policies in place by incentivising SAF production. Uh, before we take a few questions, just a reminder that the presentation will be available on our website shortly and there's going to be a press release as well with all the numbers. So, uh, who wants to ask a question to Hemant? Okay, we'll start over there at the back. Hi, Joanna Bailey, Simple Flying. Uh, Hemant, I just wondered if you think that the price of SAF will ever kind of balance out with the price of jet fuel, you know, as it's ramped up in production, will it become cheaper? Um, or do we have to face the fact that flying is going to get more expensive in the future? Yeah, I, I think that's, a, of course, a very, very important question. I mean, I think as it's ramped up, as we're able to increase the volumes, we would expect it to get cheaper. You know, as, as, as we need to move away from what is a scarce supply issue right now, and then it would inevitably get cheaper. Now, will flying get more expensive? There, there are costs to net zero, so we need to understand how best that's going to work. Um, but um, it's not a question of just transferring those costs. Airlines work in a competitive environment as well. So we, we'll have to see. I can't answer the first part of your question because that's really crystal ball glazing, I think. Eh? <laughs> Thank you, Hemant. Well, go at the front, please. Yeah, Ian Taylor from Travel Weekly London. Um, the graphic showing the feedstock component pathway is, is, you know, a nice graphic, but it doesn't show the relative weight of the components. Do you have some uh, forecast for the comparative weight of these for 2030, 2050? Yeah, indeed, that's a, that's a really good question. So that's something we're going to be working on um, at this moment, and hopefully we'll be able to roll something out quite soon next year. We, as I mentioned earlier, what we need to do is to re-understand what is the comparative availability uh, for the different feedstocks by region. Uh, but we all, and what would that yield in terms of production? But we also need to look at what is the economic benefit as well from those developments. Thank you. Are there other questions? Yes. So I would like to know, do you foresee that there could be a situation where in some areas there might be a choice between either producing food or producing SAF? No, actually, because the sustainability criteria for uh, SAF is, is quite clear that there shouldn't be any, any competition for, with food and, and for um, any... Um, uh, additional water requirements and, and chemical requirements as well. So in that sense, no, I think we're, we're, we're on good ground. What is important is that we're able to continuously uphold the stringent sustainability criteria going forward. And that's very, very important for us as well. Uh, hey, Christian from Valerio Economico in Brazil. Uh, actually, actually, my question is regarding a topic I, I've read recently uh, that some airlines, they are actually investing money on SAF production, like a, a way to, to guarantee this kind of capital resources that it is not available today. Uh, do, you see, do you see that as a path, at least for the short term, in terms of uh, gathering this kind of produ production you want? And actually, a second question more related to it, uh, what else can be done by airlines uh, besides asking for this private investment or government support to guarantee SAF production in the short term. Thank you. Yeah, I think we're, we're seeing increasing examples where airlines are working 
with suppliers, examples of taking it further in terms of vertical integration as well. And I think we will see that increase as well. It's, it, it's, it's good to see that. It's good to see you know, developments in terms of business models and airlines seeing the opportunity to invest um, to understand how best they can actually develop their sustainable fuel requirements going forward as well. And I think um, the second part of your question, uh, sorry, remind me again, was on the... What else can be done, I mean, besides that, besides asking you to afford this private investment or government support, is there anything else airline can do to guarantee yeah. the self production? Yeah, no, indeed. Um, so one of the areas where airlines are also active is, is, is maybe working together to see what they can do to, to pull together demand as well. Right, and what can be done in terms of how we can better regionalize or diversify the production capabilities and, and utilize the feedstocks as well. And I think we will see a, a significant acceleration of, of that in the coming years. Thanks, Hemant. Andrea Schulz, FBW. Uh, Herman, do you see a progress as far as Virgin's recent successful 100% SAF flight from London to New York will stimulate the production of SAF here in Europe, for instance? I, I think it helps, absolutely. I mean, I think it's, it's a key milestone. It's a key milestone we, we uh, identified in our roadmaps as well. And it's very important that it's, it's been proven for the public. I mean, technically, it was proven, but to demonstrate it, I think, is, is a very important milestone. It makes everyone understand this is reality, and we're moving in this direction. Thank you. Can we go at the back, please? Richard Sruman, Air Insight. Uh, one of the slides you showed is the SAF production in the North America, which is the highest in the world. Is that an effect from the Inflation Reduction Act? Or what do you see in this respect? Yes, indeed, it's, it's primarily from the uh, from the Inflation Reduction Act and and the the US SAF Grand Challenge, which are interlinked now. Yeah, indeed, that is that is the biggest initiative which is there right now from the US. And as I mentioned, um, what's interesting from our perspective in that is it's it's formed from the collaboration with industry, and I think that has the best prospects of really moving forward. Um, because where we are with SAF, we need, yes, the investment, that is clear, but in, in many cases, we also need some sort of support to make that investment and that business proposition viable as well. And that is what I think the SAF grant challenges will be able to utilize. Thank you. Can we go to the front, please? Uh, Sally Gethin in Flight News. Um, you said at the start of your presentation that the aim was to decentralize SAF production. And then in the chart you showed, it looked as if there were whole huge parts of the world, um, Africa, parts of Asia and Latin America, that, well, basically didn't have dots on them. And, uh, you know, is the industry doing enough to actually, um, n not only to redistribute or distribute SAFs across the world, but also use it as an opportunity for um, inwards investment into these parts of the world that sometimes have traditionally been left out by developed nations and, you know, the more commercial parts of the world. Yeah, in indeed, th th thank you for that question. Um, so, the, I mean, you quite rightly point out that there are big gaps there, and, and um, that is really part of the objective from the, from the CAF output as well, and it's something we need to focus on as well. Um, I think it's one of our priorities to make sure that we can support, find ways in which we can best facilitate new, new feedstocks and production facilities going into those regions. And I think we also understand that there's only so much you can rely on in terms of conventional market forces. And given the time frame we have, we need to really try and make sure we can, we can support filling in those gaps as early as possible. All right, can we go there? And then we'll have time for one more question. Thank you. Hello again, cut off from the Air Transport World. Just two points. Um, during the last IATA AGM, I met several airline CEOs which are very skeptic if the goals can be reached until 2050. So do you think maybe the skepticism is getting less now? And some CEOs told me, <clears throat> especially from Africa, they say, well, it's a nice thing, the stuff, but 
I have challenges to get kerosene in Africa and my nation as well, so how should I get south one day? So do you think uh, the skepticism is going down in this way? So I, I think the challenge we have for 2030 and, and particularly 2050 is challenging. That means that, that it, is a, it is a big challenge. But we do see a solution and, 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 a, and a way through this and, and to ramp up the volumes which are necessary. There is a lot of action that's required from ourselves as a trade association, from airlines and from different stakeholders, including governments as well. And we will continue to push on that, but we do see a very workable trajectory to actually get there. Uh, yeah, Ian, Ian Taylor again. You, you talked about the stringent sustainability requirements relating to, to SAF, but the US is producing SAF with corn derived from corn derived ethanol, isn't it? And Virgin Atlantic, for example, expects to source 70% of its SAF from the US by, by 2030. So how does that fit with the food, you know, the stringent requirements? No, in, indeed. So this debate about um, sustainability criteria will continue. I think what's important for us is that we're able to uphold the stringency itself um, on the global scale. And that's really important. And of course, what's happening in the US will also be coordinated in terms of what's happening in ICAO and we will see how that develops overall. Um, I don't think what it, uh, it's, it's not right that all requirements or any purchases which have been agreed from the US will, will actually meet what you talked about right now, because, because the, the agreements were made beforehand. And I think that that particular agreement you spoke about will be upholding the stringent requirements we already have. <laughs> 